All right, all right, all right. Since all the good things come in threes, I hope you guys will enjoy the third episode of our Abacus tutorial series. Today's topic is shells. My name is Josh and let's get started. We'll talk about uh, a lot of things today. So this includes the conventional shells, the general purpose elements in here, thick shell, thin shell elements, um, the continuum shells, which are very special for Abacus and can be quite useful. And of course, we'll wrap it up with an example on shells, which I will go through here in the video. And then later we'll switch to Abacus and redo this example and then hopefully see some nice results. I hope you all attended the lecture on shells, paid attention, asked the question when you didn't understand something regarding the theory because as always we'll cover more or less the basics from the application side in here. So shells. Um, it's basically from a mathematical perspective uh, the problems are reduced to two dimensions. And in here Abacus provides two general classes of shell elements along with some special elements which we will talk about in a minute. These two classes are for once the conventional shell, ele shell elements and then the continuum shell elements. We'll talk about the differences in more detail later on. But generally you can say shells are used when the thickness is around or less than 1 20th of the other dimensions. This, this is a rough estimate, sometimes in some cases even 1 10th could be a criterion to go for shells if you can justify the use. So as it was with the last episode, I, can, I cannot stress enough that it's important to really think about is my problem suited for the application of shells and I hope by the end of this episode you will have a better understanding when to use it, when it makes sense to use it and especially uh, in some future episodes we'll also talk about classical 3D solid elements and maybe we'll uh, talk about some of the problems especially related to bending that solid um, elements show and here the advantage of shells is significant and especially if you look up the term element locking, we'll talk about this in our solid element course, um, that is quite important under bending behavior because it has, it, it yields a too high stiffness, a too high bending stiffness. So here shells perform significantly better and just more closely to an analytical result. For example, if you do classical three-point bending of sheets and stuff. Um, in some cases, the application of boundary conditions is more difficult and the depiction of it is not as realistic as it would be possible um, with solids elements, the same holds true for contact conditions. So when you have a lot of complex bodies interacting, usually doing shell is not so much of a good idea. Um, this could include self-contact, however, um, it depends definitely on your problem. In general, you can say that the convergence rate is much better especially if you include a lot of folding, um, sometimes even if you include self-contact, so it's still, it might be depicted less accurately. However, you generally have less numerical problems when you use shell elements instead of other type of elements. And of course, since you need to store less tensorial information per element, you use uh, less disk space. Uh, on the right you see some of the nomenclature and you see that the um, starting letter differentiates between the type of uh, shell element. This could include special things like heat transfer shells. Um, you have the number of nodes, um, the, whether or not you go for a reduced integration uh, 
then you have the degrees of freedom or if it's temperature displacement coupled. Um, we will not talk about this in this part of uh, the tutorials. And warping is considered in small strain formulation as an option if you use small strain formulation, which usually does not take into account warping. I hope you guys remember a little bit about warping uh, the last time we talked about it in our beam tutorial. Okay, so much for the element uh, general things. Okay, some remarks. Um, um, other than the two general um, classes, the conventional shell and the continuum shell model, we also have the option to choose membrane elements and surface elements. Um, all I can say is that they are special purpose elements, so they are quite rarely used and especially in metal forming, usually your workpiece might consist of a shell and so you choose shell elements to model your workpiece, but um, membranes elements, for example, are used for um, inflating objects like uh, thin rubber sheets forming a balloon. In some applications, you maybe if you model some reinforcement layers of, let's say, maybe PVC combined with a, a like a stacked layer of metal or steel and PVC or something, or some other special applications, then you could use membrane elements. Uh, surface elements are even weirder, I would say, because they have no inherent stiffness at all, <laughs> at all, but um, only mass per unit area. So uh, they are often used to model dummy surfaces inside or outside of a different other continuum body. So, for example, the if you model a tank and you have some oil or whatever remaining on the surface of your um, tank, then um, you could model this oil film with such kind of elements. So it gives mass, especially if you do gravity or if you consider gravity in your simulation. Adding mass at some point or the other might be of interest. However, you do not add any stiffness to the overall problem. And in some other cases, you use it just as a dummy surface for contexts where it might be difficult if you directly define the contact, for example, onto another body. So sometimes you put a surface element on top of the body and then define the contact between one body and this dummy surface. All right, so much for these special elements. Let's go back to the more uh, commonly used elements, which are um, first the class of conventional shell elements. I would use this is what people, if they talk about shell elements, they mean conventional shell elements. Um, that is because it actually looks like a 2D kind of thing. So it's, it's flat. Um, it has no thickness. When you look at it, it has no thickness and the thickness is only defined in the section property definition. So we will see this later in Abacus. It looks like a real sheet, so to say. However, it can have whatever arbitrary thickness, um, which you can also activate to be displayed. To be displayed. And I can um, highly recommend to do so, so that you don't get confused with contacts initiating or getting initiated way before you think that the objects come into contact. Okay, um, the thickness is more or less a property that only is considered in nonlinear analysis and then it's only due to the Poisson's effect. So by just compressing a sheet, you cannot compress it. If you, if you elongate it, it can geometrically shrink in the thickness direction due to the Poisson's effect. Um, displacement and rotation and degrees of freedom. So in this case, it's often useful if you um, use displacements or velocity boundary conditions. Think about that here you really have true inherent rotation degrees of freedom as it was explained to you in the lecture. And this you should also specify. Um, the geometry 
has has to have a reference surface and on this it is actually specified. So if you think about I have a thin sheet, like a true 2D sheet, but this reflects actually, let's say a, a, a five millimeter sheet, quite thick, but let's do this. So this is, let's say my model area and this is my actual body. You could say, okay, if I now have a punch coming into contact, so to say, this, the contact is, in, is in initiated at the depicted surface if you choose the reference surface to be the bottom surface. You can choose middle, this is the default, or top surface. So usually middle is the default option, so half of the th thickness is theoretically above the sheet that you see in your abacus and half is below it. Um, so sometimes people use top surface, the thing on the right, because then contacts look and feel more realistically because then the punch really gets into contact to the thing that you actually can see in Abacus. Um, we have three subclasses, the general purpose elements, the thick and thin shell elements providing um, different properties because they're based on different theories and usually we have five or six degrees of freedom which belong to small thin versus finite membrane strains. We talked about this um, in the lecture. Okay, um, the general purpose shell elements is a quite novel class of elements because it has some sort of logic behind it because um, it switches between the two classical thick and thin shell theories which were the two dominant theories back in the days and you had to, at the beginning of the simulation, you had to choose between one of the two um, including all the advantages and disadvantages. So Abacus, they came up with a nice way to combine the two so it automatically detects when the thickness becomes large to go to, to switch to a thick sh shell theory which is more accurate but also computationally more expensive and so on. And so this is definitely the user's best choice because Abacus takes care of almost everything to, depending on the evolution of your problem or the evolution of your simulation, it can switch between the theories to always provide the best bang for the buck in terms of computationally speed versus accuracy of the results. So you see some of the elements indicated here. It can um, indicate reduced integration, small membrane strain, warping. Um, so you have a lot of elements to choose from, which are, if necessary, which are switched um, in case the simulation thinks now it's best to go from one theory to the other. Uh, one thing I want to definitely mention is uh, if you go for reduced um, integration, you always have to check hourglassing. Hourglassing is um, a problem of two elements, and we will talk about this also later. Two elements deforming into, well, I'm not the best drawer. So, so this mode, if you have reduced integration with one integration point in the center, this deformation mode going from the left to the right actually has zero strains. Uh, we will talk about this in more detail uh, when we talk about solid elements, but just keep this in mind if you see such a weird pattern and then it would continue like something like this. Um, then you should refine your mesh, distribute your loads and or use different hourglass control algorithm. All right, thick shell elements. Um, I used if shear flexibility and second order interpolation is desired, so if the aspects that might influence the overall outcome of your simulation um, are 
if they matter, so to say. And I think you can remember from the Beam tutorial that we often talk about the characteristic length or support length. And in this case, you say if it exceeds one fifteenth of the characteristic length. So when before I said shells are generally used if t is smaller than one twentieth, and in some ca some cases it might be um, of interest or it might be desired to still use shell elements for larger thicknesses, then go for thick shell elements because then you make sure that the things going on will be probably quite accurately uh, be reflected. So that can include large rotation, but usually only small strains, which is a drawback of a thick shell element type. However, you can understand that you probably won't have that large strains, strains in um, thick shell elements due to the um, ratio between thickness and the other two dimensions. The opposite is the case um, for thin shell elements. So if you're not so much interested in the sheer flexibility and can live with the assumption that go into this type of theory, um, you can use this type of element because it saves computational time. And this is usually the case for classical very thin shells. You use the thin shell. I mean, it's quite obvious, right, to use thin shell elements for uh, thin shell-like problems and um, because it also can provide uh, an analytical solution of the Kirchhoff constraint. This was mentioned in the lecture, I hope. And um, so this is quite an interesting element that is not entirely numerically solved, but partly analytical. So this is quite a super accurate um, way to calculate what's going on in this shell element. There are other types of elements which do this numerically, which given today's computation power is also quite okay. And um, yeah, so the, these elements are listed over here.